is listening diamond fists to the moon diamond fists up elon musk's butt right fisting fisting <laughs> hard fisting hard Ple- pleasure <laughs> unspeakable pleasure <laughs> that's is that that is not a south african accent i don't know how to do one <laughs> that's a really hard one to do it's sort of like i'm experience like yeah it's like uh new zealand <laughs> i, mean, <laughs> I live in south africa to- it's appropriate to talk about diamond fists because Elon Musk made his, his family made money off of blood diamonds. That was that was I was mar- marrying many different ideas there. Jesus, I'm a genius. You're fucking just <laughs> next level, dude. I'm sorry, yeah, but it's true. I'm on one right now because I had one cup of coffee. King shit. I thought that Elon Musk made his money from selling Axe body spray. <laughs> Well, I made the joke. He should sell a fragrance called Elon Musk. Like it, he it, really that's should. Pretty obvious, yeah. Yeah, I think that's been that's an old ass joke, but like could call it a uh, computer Musk, or he could do grime grimy <laughs> Musk or something. Some sort of combo. grimy Musk would be good. Like when they fuck, like it, bottling that intermingling scent. He should for sell it. In, he should sell it in one of those um, like aerosol like keyboard cleaner sprays, where he, <laughs> like with the long fucking nose <laughs> that you like, just put in your armpit. That, would feel good. that sounds like yeah. it feels good. Yeah. Well, you should be able to go to one of those Tesla like charging stations and refill up your can of Musk too. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> one stop um, shop. Well, speaking of uh, apartheid states, uh, sure. <laughs> of the sure. soul. Uh, welcome to Spine Crackers, everybody. Right. Yes, I'm Matthew. I'm Paul, your host. I'm Gabe, your uh, co-host. Yes. And I'm a co-co-host. And uh, <laughs> today, we are On this discussing lovely Sunday morning, morning edition, Spinecrackers morning edition. It's special. Morning edition. Don't often do this. Probably noticed the vibes are a little different. It's because Matt became an <laughs> uncle last night. So cheers to Matt. I became uncle an uncle. I, I love giving out any information, but hey, <laughs> cheers. <laughs> <laughs> If there's any listeners out there who want to comb through all baby birth <laughs> records from the entire United States, you can you could theoretically figure out. Don't who Matt even is. throw down the gauntlet. There's some. There's <laughs> always some person. So Matt, was that was that a hospital? Was what hospital or was it? Home <laughs> yeah. or? It's a, it was at St. Mary's in Kansas City, right? Yeah, we drove yep. pretty far to yeah. Uh, no, I was trying to give you one out that you do live there. Well, you by far, I live in Nevada. Like two hours. Oh, right. You live in Nevada. Sorry, that is far. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, it is weird to have my status changed in, a, in, a, in just a day, next day. Have you, are you, do you feel like you've added a new identity category to your list? And yes, and beautiful weaving in. Thank yes. you, thank you. And that's how easy it works, and, and, and the identity categories uh, are also from... <laughs> Mostly external forces, mm. you know. Yeah, I didn't you, ha- you, you didn't make a baby. I didn't have the dang kid, but now I'm now I'm gonna get now I'm an uncle technically, and it's like you had no whoa. choice in the matter. No choice whatsoever. Sort of like people who are people who are born into racial or gender categories. That's right, or are already in those categories and have more f- thrusted upon them or forced on them by others. Yeah, indeed. Mine happens to be a, a happy development, right? But not so for many people, including author of today's book, Nam de Plume, notably. Yes. Already, you know, throwing in the complications of identity and and uh, even even in the form of your name, uh, Jean Jean, Jean. Tumor, Jean Tumor's uh, book Cain. Cain, nineteen twenty three, right? Yeah. Um. And the reason we should say the reason we know it's Jean and not Jean 
is because he, as you said, Matt, he adopted this name. His last name is Tumor in real life, or was. But he adopted Jean as his first name after Jean Valjean, right? Yes. And, and some other guy from a book that I didn't know. Jean Valjean's the... He's he's the dude who's just being chased, right? Constantly for the stealing the bread. Yes, I think so. The sort of persecuted throughout his entire life, no matter what he makes of himself type of character. Yes, which is appropriate in again for Tumor, because that was sort of his feeling, I think. And John had two. Well, I I mean I, not to like do too front heavy on the biography of the writer, off the bat, but it is also fascinating. Um. Because, right, he, he was born, and he was, I believe, Nathan was his name? Yeah, Nathan, Nathan something, Tumor. And then uh, that marriage fell apart, and his mother's father demanded that she change it again to not Nathan, because that was his dad's name, and the dad was a sort of disgraceful figure amongst the, his mother's family. Right. And then he was Eugene? Eugene, yep. And then he, and so that's like, you, you see the end of Gene there, and then it was like... He chose Jean. Uh, yeah, it, the, 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 I, I like it, thinking that he chose to. Uh, he was like Eugene. He's like no, I Gene. What if his yeah. name was I Gene? You Jean. Me me Jean. I, I Jean. 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 My Jean. <laughs> this is yeah. well, If there's any free association podcasts out there, <laughs> <laughs> listen, jo- Joyce and Word Tumble, another uh, uh, modernist influence. I mean, Joyce kind of. It's so hard to find someone from this era, especially that wasn't like, holy shit, Joyce, now I'm influenced. Yeah. But, you know, yeah. But that happened here, for sure. Yes. Um, so, yeah, so uh, this is my pick, right? Yeah, so why'd you pick this, Gabe? I mean, I don't really know. I picked it because... <laughs> Unacceptable. Uh, <laughs> okay, you're, you're always saying, I don't have a good reason. JK. Um. I picked it because, you know, I thought, I, I've read some of the, so this book is sort of broadly associated with a couple different literary traditions, right? Matt's already mentioned modernism and Joyce and, um, you know, some of those other kind of writers, uh, but it's also notably associated with the Harlem Renaissance, sort of one of the earlier kind of influential texts in that movement. Um, Tumor you know, bounced around a lot in his life in terms of where he lived. He lived in New York City, he lived in D.C., he lived in Georgia. Um, Did he uh, live in Chicago? I think Chicago for a time, right? Because uh, the story towards the end about when it switches to Chicago, I, th- I think I read that it was a little biographical. He, well, I don't remember. I, I don't remember if he actually lived in yeah. Chicago. But he bounced around a lot anyway. But But so this text is sort of one of the, you know, associated broadly with the Harlem Renaissance as well, although, as we'll get into, Tumor was kind of ambivalent or went back and forth about his association with that movement specifically and sort of, you know, African-American literature in general. Um, We'll talk about all that. But anyway, I, you know, I've read and have been sort of revisiting a little bit some some of Baldwin's work and... um, uh, uh, Langston Hughes, some of the other writers that are generally associated with that um, time period and that movement. And this is a book that I had never heard of before. Um, and it seemed kind of worth reading both to kind of fill out my understanding of or, or deepen my understanding of that movement, that era, um, and just kind of seemed attractive on its own for various reasons once I started learning a little bit more about it. That's it. It's just a just a cool time period for for all sorts of writing. Yeah. And yeah, it's just like a just a lot of stuff going on. There's just a lot of like cultural, political, you know, foment happening and like shifts in in what would be like the re- our realities, you know, yes. now and stuff like that. It's really cool. Yeah. And the um, what the book came out and was pretty highly regarded by critics but it uh went out of print pretty quickly didn't sell well classic and critical a, success commercial failure yes. classic cult yeah. book it, and then it, it's, it's had a, a it, it bit it of a resurgence like, yeah they said it sold what like a thousand copies in its first run or something under yeah yeah and i and read that he was like happy with the 
with the critics' response to it, and he didn't really care about the selling, uh, the sales of it, which, you know, makes. Well, me he like was happy more. that it was well received, but uh, again, you know, he was unhappy that it was sort of discussed under the umbrella of, oh, this is black literature, this is African American mm. literature, right? Yes, he he had a pretty ambitious goal for his art and what it would inspire and catalyze like socially oh, amongst yeah. the entire country. I mean, I and I always love that that sort of thing, you know, there's almost like a Tolstoyan level of uh utopianism to what he was hoping to achieve. Absolutely. And we, and, we'll... and he he started to feel that like right I think the other thing was that kind of maybe a bit of uh cope for the thing not taking root and like being read by people yes. was he's like well you know what writing's actually lame and it's it's actually <laughs> words and intellection are, are getting in the way of this and so he became i think way more right like politically involved as opposed to artistically and in, well and he well yeah he I mean, he was he did remain sort of politically involved in new york i think specifically he gave talks to like young black writers and stuff like that it, right but, but but you're totally right that they, he did take it's com, it's complete cope. It was complete yeah. cope because th <laughs> this is the only book he read or he was wrote. Fuming. This, is the, this is the only book he ever wrote. Um, there, yes. he, he did some other like essays and poetry and stuff, I think. But this is the only like novel and calling it a novel. It's not. A, I mean, that's maybe open for interpretation. But is vignettes a cool thing to say? I don't know if that's I true like, either. I mean, it is. It, well, it, so the, the structure of the book, maybe we should just explain, is like. It's kind of a collection of sketches of individuals at various moments in their lives in, and in various places. It jumps back and forth between Washington, D.C. and a fictionalized version of um, a town in Georgia called Sparta, where uh, Toomer had taught or had worked as a, a school principal for a, a two, short months. <laughs> two months, a very short yeah. period of time. Um and uh, I think, right, there is one that takes place in Chicago, or, right, it's only the one story that happens in Chicago, I think, right? Which is yeah. another, I think this is what Paul was saying, that's another one of the, that was supposedly more related to uh, Tumor's own experience, because he was, uh, like, a phys ed teacher, or yes. some sort of, like, youth, you know, I don't know, like, sports gym instructor in Chicago. Maybe it was Chicago. I'm not sure. I think that might be yeah, where he sure. went to school originally, where he, he, he went to the, uh, like, um, you know, Chicago, like, medical yes. phys ed teacher college or something. Yeah. So that's the, that's the Chicago connection. Um, but, of course, but, like, I mean, he also jumped around in terms of his studies and his, like, he went just back and forth, like, back to school, like, three or four times and dropped out after a year every time and studied different things and, like, so even intellectually, like, there's so much, uh, uh, you know, ambiguity in terms of his identity and what he was doing and what he was interested in. Um, that feels way more relatable to today's experience, especially yeah, ca sure. career-wise, as you know, like, there's no, it, which is funny because, I don't know, you, you tend to throw back to that time and think, like, you, you go to school and then you become a company man, and, like, at least in terms of the job trajectory. right. But he had way more of the what feels like a contemporary style of tenuous employment yes. uh, over really different, not related at all fields. And he just constantly <laughs> found himself being like, I don't have professional skills in anything. <laughs> you, you're like, you, you, you would ask, you would ask to him or like, what do you do? You'd be like, oh, I'm a writer. And he's just a gym teacher. Yes, exactly. Right. <laughs> he would be kind of, that is kind of the vibe. Um, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, so yeah, to, he, we should, I guess we should say, I mean, again, not to give away everything about his biography here at this early moment, but he was a mixed race, uh, writer, right? He's, yeah. he was, uh, uh, his grandfather, um, was the first black governor ever elected in the United States in Louisiana. Um, what was it? BPS pinchback. pinchback. Yeah. yeah. Um, and so he was related to him or PBS, sorry. Um, and he was related to him on his mother's side, and his father was a, a freed slave, um, also of mixed race. And so Toomer was uh, kind of, you know, through in this book and his the rest of his life, kind of reckoning with his identity as, you know, someone who was um, by the sort of one drop rule in the United States, which said if you have <laughs> any any you know, lineage to people of color anywhere, then you are considered a person of color. 
Um, but, you know, by all sort of accounts, Toomer came across generally as, as white. There's some argument about whether or not he, like, consciously passed as white um, at points in his life. Um, Just look and, up photos of him. Yeah, yeah. You Well, because you, you mentioned this is, I don't know if this is, I don't know if I should say this. Ah, uh, whatever. But he, he, if you look up photos of him, he does kind of look like, and I'm bringing it up for a reason, he kind of looks like uh, Abed from Community, right? <laughs> yeah. He does have that vibe. And the reason he has I'm, a Daniel Pudi, that's his actor's he, name. Yeah, and the reason I'm bringing it up is because there's a, a evidence, and Tuma wrote about this in his journals and stuff, when he was... He, he was in school, I think, in Wisconsin at one point, or lived in Wisconsin yeah. as well. and Like, like an it, agri- agronomy school or something. Right, and at various points in his life, including there, people actually assumed he was Native American. Yeah. So he has this very kind of, like, ambiguous appearance, and he, like, didn't really go out of his way to ever correct anybody because he didn't see himself in those ways either. Um, right. So I just thought it was interesting and kind of worth bringing up for that reason. Yeah. Yeah, he's kind of like uh, that South Park episode when all the aliens are that certain uh, skin tone. It's kind of him. Marklar? You know what I'm talking about? Is it Marklar? Is it Marklar? I don't remember. I'm not a big fan <laughs> of South Park. <laughs> Why? Yeah. You brought it up, bro. It's like this show that I don't watch and sucks. <laughs> I do kind of think it sucks. Uh, I mean, that's that's a debate episode for another day. Yeah. Yeah. But... Yeah, the relative merits of South Park over time. Oh, yeah, um, yeah. I'll just say, yeah. I don't think it sucks, but when someone brings it up to me, I'm like, I roll my eyes. Cringe, yeah, yeah. It's my final uh, That's true. Statement Interesting. Line. Interesting that you both embody it and dislike it. And then you also, but you also brought it up just now. Yeah. <laughs> I did bring it up. Well, just for fun, just for giggles. But that, I think that's more, what you're describing is more like the dystopian element to what might have might happen in Tumor's idealized post-racial future yeah um which in contemporary ears probably rings as pretty eye-rolling yes. and naive and lame and, and and yeah but anyway well but in a way i mean and and again right we're talking a lot about his biography and stuff that we've kind of gleaned from texts that we've read around this like including the introduction i know paul you read some supplemental stuff as well but um, yeah, Toomer kind of was doing the post-racial thing like way before it was like, you know, when we think post-racial now, I think most people think about like Obama basically, right? Because yes. that was kind of the moment where the po- like post-racial ideology had, you know, gained a little bit of purchase, right? Because that was a huge, obviously a huge historic moment for a black president and people were kind of tempted to the you know, <laughs> like, well, we did it. You know what I mean? Like, right. <laughs> yeah. racism is gone, y'all. We, we, we fucking did it. Mm-hmm. Um, and, but, you know, Toomer was kind of like mining that vein in the fucking 20s, which is, which is nuts. Or at least mining that vein, not in terms of believing it to be an actual reality, but talking about it as a sort of, as you said, Matt, a kind of utopian goal that he was consciously pursuing in his work and through his own kind of sense of himself and his own identity. Yeah. 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 I mean, I, I, I do wonder if you, if you can point to, to his beliefs or his want for some sort of utopian racial society. Um, maybe it's because of his identity and the ambiguity of his own race and how other people saw him and how he saw himself that influenced that idea for him. Yeah. I think he was confronted with, the absurdity of a lot of categorizations that have negative <laughs> impacts on people's lives as absurd right. really, really fast, like really immediately. Yeah. Well, and I mean, like you, like you brought up already, Matt, like he was, he, 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 you know, had his name just arbitrarily changed because right. his grandfather didn't like the guy he was named after. Tw- like twice before <laughs> he was even conscious. Right, yeah. Right. And so like, yeah, these sort of are, you know, he, what he saw as kind of these arbitrary labels that, needed to be kind of transcended or, or subverted or whatever. And it, it's it's not fair to, to compare what I think Toomer's, again, like, yeah, very, very ambitious artistic hopes were for his work with, like, the 
in the cynical dimension, the the really like politically deployed term post racial right. as you know, uh, I don't know, just a sort of wedge kind of false idol to to get a technocrat in the office. <laughs> yeah, it's right, right, right. Yeah, it's definitely reductive. And what Toomer's up to is is as you say, artistically on a grander scale, I think. He he really wanted to you know, he 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 at times said his he, he claimed his identity was American, which is interesting. Yeah. Because nowadays that's what you hear from the far right who wanna talk who wanna say, Oh, oh, you're playing the race card. We're all Americans, like whatever. <laughs> um and Toomer, you know, was not that. He was like basically a Marxist. Basically, a, a sort of you know, cl- you know, he was interested in class and socialism and the way that you know. I think if there's a if there's a co- contemporary term that I think might be more appropriate for part of what Toomer was trying to do, rather than post racial, it would be like class reductionism. <laughs> um, sure, I think he he might get accused of that in some Twitter circles today. Although I I, I would like to I don't read, actually read... think that's what he's doing, but yeah. yeah. Right, but it, and and this is more derived from you know the bits of biography that we've read. Um, but I, let's uh, shall we direct our attention to the what's been written in but the book? Yes, God the forbid, because con- the content of the book is is it contains all the stuff we're saying in a much more integrated and sublimated form, right? Like yes. it, it, you wouldn't go, oh, a Marxist is writing. No, uh, it, upon reading these things, which are already interesting for the fact that they're like, like we said, they're like little fragments that just focus in on a particular person or persons in various parts of, America, you know, places with very. Uh, You're um cutting uh, up a little bit there, Matt. My camera. Yeah. Yeah. First time on the podcast. Oh my god. Uh, Here, I'm gonna I'm gonna pause and we'll come back. Okay. All right, we're back, we back, folks. Apologies, Elon Musk uh, hacked into our feed. He didn't like us <laughs> saying he was getting fisted by diamonds <laughs> or whatever. <laughs> I kind of lost my train of thought. I don't. I don't. You were about what to read. Saying. You were about to read something, and you were talking about how you know if you read the text, it's not like oh, in your face, I'm a Marxist. In your face, I'm a post-racialist. It's it's much more kind of these, you know, sketched mini portraits and and interspersed with poetry and. You know, in well, the tricky, I was, sort of in the modernist tradition, right? Right. There, he had. I, I was first of all. No, I was not really about to read anything specific. Oh, okay. But um, yeah. Like, it, it's interesting just because the structure of the book is in, incredibly intentional. I would have never picked up on it had I not read his like Jean's own accounting of it. But and the introduction. All, Shout yeah. outs to George Hutchinson. Yes. Um, but. Yeah, all of these little vignette scene things were also published in varying in various like leftist and literary avant-garde journals and magazines and stuff and then like collated. Yes. Um were they all previously published? I don't know if all of them were, but a, ch- a good chunk of them were, right? Maybe the last one um yeah. was supposed to be a stage play that he ended up turning into a prose Did- story there's a couple that have that like play vibe too which is really interesting just yeah just very be- dialogue mm-hmm. heavy and and the way he denotes people speaking versus thinking which i actually really yes, loved it was really, i like that a lot too was just yeah. the name of somebody and then a colon and then there was either quotes around it if they were actively speaking or there weren't if they were just thinking right and it was their interior i've uh, never really seen anyone do it like that before it seems so obvious too like yeah. you're like easy clap <laughs> easy fucking clap. just put their name next to the words they're thinking and, and then i'll know <laughs> but i was like actually like someone imp- tell like, evan dara please well <laughs> oh this <God>. <laughs> cycle that guy back in to the real world right shout outs but um yeah, so so the the reading experience is again because there's some sort of like the modernists love their their uh, their like sub rosa architecture yes. of of their books, um, which I don't know t- just on an first impression basis the reading experience was like strange and kind of like feverish almost feeling totally and there were these um and this was something that I think Tumor intended very much. There are these like emotional crests and valleys yep. 
because um, he was describing things as like moving along these curves, which eventually create a, uh, a closed loop or something like that. Yes, yeah, yeah, and yeah. There are, yeah, there are pages that have weird uh, segmented circle. There's like three or four of them that have these weird just like segments of a circle, like either just the top curve or like the top and, or the top right and bottom. And I think that it's it's a way of signaling exactly what you're talking about, Matt, that Tumor has... There's a geog there's an internal geography to this book. There's like a, a way that it moves, right? Right. And I think it's both emotional and also like geographical, kind of like moving around the country from Georgia to to DC to Chicago back to Georgia. Um, yeah. So that 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 was a pretty like and it's a fairly slim volume. About 150 and pages of text, I think. There's there's poetry as the kind of like load-bearing connective tissue between these things that sort of because i think tumor was like a poet beforehand he mm -hmm. was one of these guys that i think was like a poet and then like sank to in some in their own self-conception like sank to prose or like the writing of a book <laughs> right. i know bolaño felt that way is that true i didn't know that yeah he was like when i became a novelist like I felt like I was becoming basically just a vacuum salesman or something. <laughs> just bullshit. I want to be a poet, but I no do, one gives I, a fuck about poetry. I do think Toomer probably felt that way, which is probably why it was so easy for him to give up and stop writing, like, prose. Yeah, he's like, oh, this didn't work out? Fuck this. Now, forever. Yeah. But no, the, the experience play, was strange. I'm going to be a gym teacher and uh, play Foursquare with my, with my <laughs> students. Foursquare is Dude, fun Foursquare as shit. Foursquare is the juice. Especially if you use those like stupid like electric lines and like with all that bolt all the oh, bullshit yeah. extra rules. You can make that shit really complicated. You we really should can. Do a, Me we too. should do an episode while we're playing Foursquare while recording. The official Spinecrackers Foursquare tournament. You know what would be cool is like a novel written a, like with the format of uh, kids playing Foursquare or something and every time it hits a particular square you have to like it's it, you know it, it initiates some different segment or theme or something like That'd that. That's a good idea. Let's all let's write a book. No, let's just write a book on this I'm podcast. Do I'll do like it. Like a group homework assignment where it's a disaster and one of us doesn't do anything. <laughs> <laughs> Fortnite, more like four square. Yeah, the original <laughs> Fortnite, huh, kids? Get back to your roots, kids. Um, That's right. Come full yeah. circle. Exactly. Speaking of full circle and get yeah, there you go, Paul. Yeah, I did it. Hey. Um, so I don't know what y'all's like, just initial non forebrained first, just sort of emotional impressions were about reading it. I, I'll go first. I guess I I was kind of like you know, uh, I I definitely was a little bit more focused on the I was I was potentially missing the forest for the trees. I think in my initial reading, in terms of like getting wrapped up in like holy shit this little story is beautiful and that we're like this poem is great or whatever yeah and kind of like like losing i lost a little bit of the overall architecture but then oh, when too. i had some time to kind of step back and like think about why are these fucking weird pages here with these yeah. like segmented circles or whatever i i, I it, it start it came together in a, in a way for me for sure yeah i mean in terms of just the writing style and thinking about the structure i really i really enjoyed it i i think i am one to not normally enjoy this sort of structure i kind of shy away from it but i've been liking things like this more and more and um i think maybe even the first like three quarters of the book really isn't even that dialogue heavy which i also don't really like it's more right and the narrator is kind of removed from the stories he's 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 kind of just describing things that are happening in real time but with really beautiful writing and an interesting way of just, um, it's kind of stream of consciousness in some ways, but not exactly either. But uh, Especially, like you said, Paul, in those early ones, which are much more kind of descriptive and atmospheric and like way less dialogue. Like the dialogue heavy stuff is towards the end of the book where it's, it, it, like, like Matt said earlier, it takes on that kind of like play, you know, structure. And you get more information from Toomer as a narrator too. Yes, like, definitely. Yes. I would say. Definitely. Because it it's like, before it's like a sense of place. And also a lot of the stories are are, are very sad and, and almost like gothic. Definitely. Uh, it's just like people experiencing misfortune in this, uh, yeah, very like imagistic, feverish <laughs> uh, world. And, and 
the human body is like conjured really specifically at certain times yes. and then it just like kind of melts away i always got the sense of like again i think very specific like intentionally of uh the body kind of existing way too specifically and then like dissolving and not really mattering yes i think specifically as you go in in and out of the consciousnesses versus the perceptive exterior world of the characters one of the things that i one of the themes that i picked up on or like a or like a, a pretty consistent metaphor that tumor was using in a lot of these stories was as you said, Matt, like the body, it was like these analogies and disanalogies between the body and a house. Like he talks about the like the body being or having or like in some cases carrying a house like mm-hmm. a lot to the point where it like stuck to me. Yeah. Um, and I think that like it, it's 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 in this interesting sort of way of commenting on like interiority and like 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 the the, the physical space of a house is really important in a lot of these stories, um, particularly right. when we're down in Georgia and he talks a lot about and this is where I think some of the the left sort of Marxist stuff does come in because he is very class conscious and he is very sort of like he's talking about these factory towns and this sort of like looming factories and sawmills that like yes. like like pollute the entire like area and and I was actually thinking of Twin Peaks a little bit. Yeah, it does kind of have some Twin Peaks vibes, I think. Weird, I wasn't thinking that. I I was I was making connections to a little bit to uh the Museum of Unconditional Surrender and you know, just that idea that um the aftermath of any traumatic event in any country, you know, slavery and whatever in our country can help but affect everyone in, in throughout every class. Yeah. So I, I was thinking of that idea a lot. Um, and just the psychological aspects of the characters, even though you get, you don't get that much, much information from individual characters, but you get, um, really a lot of ugly, uh, events. Um, and, uh, yeah, it can, it can, it's kind of tragically off putting, but very realistic. Um, Sad, sad, sad. <laughs> um, I, I'll, I'll I'll start off with the with reading because I have a section. It's kind of a somewhat long section, but I think it's worth reading just because a this was I thought one of the most beautiful passages in the book, but also it goes to that metaphor that I was kind of talking about just now. This is the it's from the chapter called Robert. Uh, fit starts on fifty three, Matt. Okay. Um, or I'm assuming it's Robert, but it's R H O B E R T. It's a great spelling of Robert. I like Robert. It. Yeah. Um, I'm just going to call him Robert. Uh, (laughs) um, Robert wears a house, like a monstrous diver's helmet, on his head. His legs are banty-bowed and shaky because, as a child, he had rickets. He is way down. Rods of the house, like antennae of a dead thing, stuffed, prop up in the air. He is way down. He is sinking. His house is a dead thing that weighs him down. He is sinking as a diver would sink in mud should the water be drawn off. Life is a murky, wiggling, microscopic water that compresses him, compresses his helmet and would crush it the minute that he pulled his head out. He has to keep it in. Life is water that is being drawn off. Brother, life is water that is being drawn off. Brother, life is water that is being drawn off. The dead house is stuffed. The stuffing is alive. It is sinful to draw one's head out of a live stuffing in a dead house. The propped up antennae would cave in and the stuffing be strewn, shredded life pulp in the water. It is sinful to have one's own head crushed. Robert is an upright man whose legs are banty-bowed and shaky because as a child he had rickets. The earth is round. Heaven is a sphere that surrounds it. Sink where you will. God is a red cross man with a dredge and respiration pump who's waiting for you at the opposite periphery. God built the house. He blew his breath into its stuffing. It is good to die obeying him who can do these things. I just th- I thought that passage was so beautiful and like that was kind of the first time that I really remembered this like house as this image you know mm-hmm. that 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 tumor comes back to a number of times. Yeah, because then uh, I f- what's the name of the story? Paul and who? Paul and Bona. 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 I think and Paul. that's the Bona one. Bona and Paul. Yeah. Where like uh, is that the one where uh, the houses are described as as the eyes of shy girls or something like that. There's a weird, another image too, where it, it's like it houses are compared be. to women who are like coquettishly yes. like looking at you, but like won't speak. I don't know what. 
That might be in um, Box Seat when he's going to meet when at the beginning he's going to meet uh, uh, Muriel. Oh, you're right, you're right. Yeah. Then it, Dan, then he, Dan and Muriel, right? Because then he goes into the house, and then there's all these weird, like, I almost thought of, like, Legos or something. Yes. Like, these weird images of people snapping into their, their places yeah. by, like, bolt action. <laughs> like, like everyone sits down, and then it's like they're, like, attached to it mechanically. It, yes. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think that's in Box Seed, which is one of my other favorite stories. Box Seed was my favorite one. Was it? By, yeah. By far. It yeah. Was, so let's talk about that one then, because you, you referenced it, that the description of the houses, which I'm looking for. Um, Let me go find. Yeah. But he, uh, uh, and, it, it, you know, again, this is like, uh, let's see. There's, there's, a, there's so many just, I think it's from that story anyway. I could be, I could be misremembering too, but... Um, this this story I actually thought was one. So this is basically a story. We're talking about box seat, Paul, um, because Matt referenced it and then said it was his favorite. Uh, this is one where I thought there was a lot of class elements. Yeah. To you know this. So it's about this guy Dan, who uh, Dan Moore, who's basically like um, kind of courting this upper class rich, you know woman girl and they're sort of uh my question was they have feelings for each other but then she has to kind of deny it and blah blah blah. and there's this culminating scene where they go to a a, a play together and she's up in a box seat and he's down in the normal seats right did did you did you i think there was again once again very probably very intentional ambiguity about like i couldn't get quite clear because like muriel i i think she was black but um was she was she either again like in a mixed household or was she somehow adopted by uh, this woman that's like in there reading the newspaper and it, being it, weird? It, yeah, it's unclear if it's like a boarding house or if she's like renting there and it's yeah. a landlady. I mean, I think this is one thing that Toomer does a lot in these stories is there is sometimes it's very clear, but sometimes there's ambiguity in the race of the characters too, right? Are they mixed? Are they white? Are they, right? you know, black? It, it's no, it's oftentimes it's, not super explicit. Or it's said at like weird times offhandedly to yes. like kind of throw you and just be yes. like, ah, you know? Uh, yeah, I highlighted a passage from that story, which Let's I think it. is, it's which is, uh, this is fairly long too, but, um, I think this has something a little bit to do because I like this story because you get kind of both. You get these somewhat more explicit, dialogue-driven kind of explications of some of Toomer's, I imagine, thought. Um, mm-hmm. And then you have because then it culminates in that scene with like d- dwarves boxing each other in a theater and so then singing weird. a song and stuff. And then uh, giving which, Muriel the, yeah. the flower. Yes, with the blood on it. Oh my god! And, yeah, like so you get like at once the more like forebrain explication of something and then this like stage setting within a stage of yeah what that means um so he's this is dan he's just uh he's in the house he's talking to muriel um what are you doing now dan same old thing muriel nothing as the world would have it living as i look at things living as as much as i can without but you can't live without money dan why don't you get a good job and settle down? And then it just says, Dan, this is him thinking. Same old line. Shoot it at me, sister. Hell of a note, this loving business. For ten minutes of it, you have to go stand the torture of an intolerable heaviness and a hundred platitudes. Well, damn it, shoot on. To what, my dear, rustling newspapers? You mustn't say that, Dan. It isn't right. Mrs. Pribby, the ambiguous landlord, maybe mom, stepmom, has been awfully good to me. Dare, dare say she has. What's that got to do with it? Oh, Dan, you're so inconsiderate and selfish. All you think of is yourself. I think of you. Too much. I mean, you ought to work more and think less. That's the best way to get along. Muscle heads get along, Muriel. There is more to you than that. Sometimes I think there is, Dan, but I don't know. I've tried. I've tried to do something with myself. Something real and beautiful, I mean. But what's the good of trying? I've tried to make people, everyone I come into contact with, happy. Dan looks at her directly. Her animalism, still unconquered by zoo restrictions and keeper taboos, stirs him. Passion tilts upward, bringing with it the elements of an old desire. Muriel's lips become the flesh notes of a futile, plaintive song or longing. 
Dan's impulse to direct her is its fresh life. Happy, Muriel? No, not happy. Your aim is wrong. There is no such thing as happiness. Life bends joy and pain, beauty and ugliness, in such a way that no one may isolate them. No one should want to. Perfect joy or perfect pain with no contrasting element to define them would mean a monotony of consciousness, would mean death. Uh, I had that same passage highlighted, that last passage. Hell yeah. <laughs> so yeah, that's like the, I don't know. I Yeah. Uh, so, you know, there again peaks some of this tension of of the realities of living and yes. and this and and some of the utopian stuff that tumor is working through uh and yeah you, like you mentioned gabe it does owe its form to marxism in which he saw a kind of unifying theory of peoples it's it's so funny because you know reading some, you know the introduction and some of the other stuff is like the, all this talk about tumor having this like grand theory this sort of unified theory of identity and like becoming this this new kind of american identity and 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 so on and so forth but these stories are all so ambiguous and so yeah. like you know open and like like all of these stories about these relationship stories none of them end clearly none of them are sort of like resolved in any kind of you know traditionally satisfying way yeah my immediate in- instinct was that this was a fairly pessimistic more despairing than not kind of book yes of someone who was like not having a good time coping with racial ambiguity and the and the and the, the various tensions of of the life and society he lived in. You know what I mean? It's yeah. Like, it's a very sad. There's a lot of violence done to people, which, I mean, obviously you can't talk about race in America without <laughs> it mostly being violent. Uh, but, and, and women really get the short shrift here. Like they're just getting fucking raped and yep. murdered and, you know, or just ignored and emotionally <laughs> abused. Like, yes. There is a lot of these weird, uh, also gender, things happening because a lot of it's like girls being sexualized or like people in these weird relationships and it's always tense you know there's always a missed connection eventually or just some way in which it's not really working yes what's the story where i think it might be esther where she's like you know a really beautiful i think black girl like young black girl and all the white men in the in her town just like basically want her to be a prostitute are you um, talking about yeah i think is that a that might be av is that av or s oh it might be av yeah. yeah but i think the like a, a class element was brought up there too and like just man's uh confrontation with himself to like try to make money and succeed in life just to have a sexual being in their bedroom you know yes like um i think there's a passage that describes like these men going off to college and trying to make a career to come back to try to get AV or a girl like AV. Like, I don't know. I think there's an element of tumor explaining the male gaze a little bit and just how, Mm. um, white men in particular, um, he felt like that, that was what they were after during this time. It was just like success to have a house, a nice shiny helmet of a house, but mostly just to have, a wife or a prostitute that it, they can afford. Right. And women being at once kind of, uh, this, you know, it's just, they're just hoes and like, they're just right. trifling and getting in your fucking way of, and then, but then also they're, it's Madonna whore stuff, you know, yeah. simultaneously yeah. they're like, uh, the solution, the, the, the entity you can, dissolve yourself into like a male angler fish you know yes. and just like oblivion and just now you're going to be happy and understanding even that that's a ludicrous two contradictions and not really knowing what to do with that paul i think we were both wrong it's actually fern i think is what oh, okay. you're thinking of <laughs> <All right. laughs> yeah. but no, notably there's either, like most of these stories i mean the longest one is about men and stuff but like yeah the fr- the front half of this book is like basically about various women yes the first yeah. yeah exactly i mean and there's and i just think like the 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 you know tumor's writing is so like generous and like to to the people he's writing about i feel like obviously some people get like you said there's various people get 
you know, horrible shit happens to people, right? But, yeah. like, his descriptions of them are so, like, you know, real and human and, like, like just feel true in so many ways. Um, and, and I just, I, like you said, I think, you know, I mean, one of the stories that really stuck with me was the early story about Becky the white woman who is oh. like ostracized by her town because she She's has like a black near child. Homeless. Yeah. yeah. And no one knows who the father is, but like some people, you know, they like surreptitiously bring her, you know, food and shit to survive on. And then like all they ever see is the kid and she, she never comes out of the house. And then eventually it's, it's destroyed. She has two kids. She and, winds up having two kids. Yeah. And they they, they end up becoming kind of notoriously like violent too. Mm-hmm. <laughs> like, and th- that's in counterpart, I think, because, like, after that story about this white woman having, you know, mixed kids and being ostracized and living basically in a sh- shack near the train tracks yep. uh, with nothing, and then the house, like, collapses on her eventually. Yep. It's like, Jesus, fuck. Uh, there's, what, karma? Karma. I believe. Spelled you know, with a C. Right. But that that concept is obviously woven in. Um, yep. Because there's some Eastern ideas. There's yeah, some later, specifically later in his life, Toomer got really into like kind of mystical spiritualism. Yo, and, you know who? You know who? Gurdjieff. Gurdjieff. Yep. This motherfucker. I I was laughed when I saw that. Oh, I was same. Just like, you know, Henry Miller loved this dude too. It's it's. I wrote Henry Miller like two or three times throughout this. Yeah, that guy Gurdjieff. What a what a successful guru. Yes. <laughs> Bless you. Um, so, what were you? What were you going to say about karma, Matt? I interrupted you. Oh well, then it's just like it felt a slightly like the counterpoint to Becky in some ways, where you know now there's uh, a black girl who like has she's she's kind of like more like the help, you know? She like right. She like does kitchen work and housework for this white uh, this this sort of um, old plantation family that's you know they, they have this young son who is about karma's age who is having basically an illicit affair with her uh and meanwhile she's kind of she's two time in a little bit and she's got like a a boyfriend a, a, a black boyfriend who's uh basically just indentured servant as well um and they find out about each other and get into a fight and it's bloody as shit <laughs> like and and i like that one because you do you get like the it flips back and there's there's like i forget the name of the dude uh i don't know if we get the name of the guy in this one we do the white guy that's that's sleeping with karma but he like hates himself for being attracted and there's like these interesting passages that are like his thoughts about you know it's basically him being like racist and being like it's disgusting. Like she's just a black woman. That's like why I'm, well, you know. And well, then wait, she, but then you... he's like, but she maybe. But then he's like, why black? Like why am I thinking of it this way? Like she's a woman and I love her. And like him, like having that tug of war, and then meeting this other guy. I think then, you uh, might be putting together two stories because shit. I think that what you're describing also well because they're similar. But what you're describing is is Blood Burning Moon. Where, oh. but it, something similar does happen in karma. We just don't. Get Karma's the guy's just name. cheat. Karma's just cheating. Yes. And right. And then yeah. Well, uh, I think she because fakes, her husband's in prison. Yeah, and then she kind of like he finds out, and then she fakes like shooting herself. Yes. Um, sorry, blood burning moon. Yeah. Um, which oof, this one was a big oof. Nasty. One of then, the one of the you know just before we get into it you know, CW I guess, but this is a very. Brutal description of uh, essentially a lynch mob, except the guy winds up being burned alive. It's funny because you know uh, when the white guy is like, "Let's fight! I want to fight you. You're you're sleeping with my girl," and he's like, "She's my girl." And then they're fighting. The black guy is like pretty it, it, the the um the courtesy almost of the b- prior to the violent death right is almost hilarious. He's like. I, I warn you again, sir. Approach yeah, me in, know, in such right. a way, and you will reap the consequences. <laughs> and then he slashes his throat. Right. <laughs> it's just like. Well, but but like again, right? Like it, that is sort of that resonates. I would say with 
to still how black people have to approach interactions with white people in authority today. Yeah, there's right? like, like this with deference police still. or yeah. whatever. You have you cannot do anything without fucking I mean saying sir. Yeah, like, exactly. Pardon me. And he knows what's coming, you know, like yep. eventually he just he just he he literally cuts the white dude's throat open. Yep. Uh and then immediately right like yeah, lynch mob comes and burns him alive. Uh and and again, there, there's there's also this eye imagery. Yes. A lot of description of eyes. In this one, it's gross. It's like his eyes burst because mm-hmm. he's on fire, which is nasty. But um, uh, the the there's a lot of descriptions of eyes and faces in orange light and yes. purple light. And uh, I didn't actually know what to make of like the the color significances uh, of like orange and stuff. But I did see it enough to note it down. And then, but then also eyes, eyeballs. Yes, and I, I also think specifically in that story, the, the description of when they're tying, uh, what's his name, Tom, um, when they're first tying him up, you know, uh, as you said, Matt, there's like this resignation. You know, he, he he's like, there's a line where. Um, the mob pressed in from the sides, taut humming, no words. A stake was sunk into the ground, rotting floorboards piled around it. Kerosene poured on the rotting floorboards. Tom bound to the stake, his breast was bare. Nail scratches let, a little, let little lines of blood trickle down and mat into his hair. His face, his eyes were set and stony. Except for irregular breathing, one would have thought him already dead. Yeah. And it's like this, this acceptance, right? Again, like this. I feel like there's this disconnect between how kind of but sort of pessimistic this book is and like what we know about Toomer as an individual and what he, his goals were. Yeah. That, yeah. I guess that was my point from way back yeah. that I was trying to make was that this book felt really, I mean, and it, and as it should on some level, but right. like, yeah, just really infused with, with a sort of violence and despair internally amongst the characters most like overwhelmingly. Did you get um, that vibe too, Paul? I mean, I I think what you guys are talking about between the disconnect of his actual Marxist beliefs and what is actually tr- like said in the text, like I didn't pick up on that at all. I didn't know that he was a Marxist. I I, I had a different forward than you guys mm. for one thing, but um, hmm. I uh, I didn't see that at all. And a lot of the um, which is interesting now that I know that it's like it's making me think a little bit about a little bit more about what like how he was trying to say that potentially within these stories um and a lot of the reviews and little snippets i have in the back of my copy talk a lot about their belief that he was trying to he believed in like a reversion back to uh african-american culture Mm -hmm. within these stories like he believed that the circle that is created within the within the short novel is actually a circle back to um, potential right. cultural roots, which I saw more, even though, you know, whatever's happening down in the South during this time was atrocious, and there potentially can't be a, re- a true reversion back to a more of a idealized, pure culture. Right. That Toothpa- he sees toothpaste in his can't mind. go back in the tube. Yeah. Exactly. Exactly. But. Um, I do, I do see that just by reading the text, I do see that more than uh, than I see some sort of message about his worldview. Even right, I agree. Uh, like there, there's, there is, there is, and and this this might be true. You know, there's all these conversations about is it possible there, uh, the dangers of the aesthetic in depicting violence or like trying to show violence or lend a spotlight on violence. And I think the only thing you can do is something closer to this, which is to not shy away from it while, uh, I guess essentially emphasizing aesthetics. Mm -hmm. And by that, I mean beauty in in it's like multifarious forms or whatever, um, that come with, yeah, like black culture and not trying to like improve it in certain ways or not, yeah, not try and just toss it out or cause he has characters, um, that are doing the way more of the, like just uh, the, they call him Dicty, right? Uh, yes. the sort of snobby, uh, 
black people who are like maybe a bit just have a bit more money they're a bit richer they go get a uh, education and they're just trying to mimic like white sort of anglo-saxon and new england and or Which, like southern that aristocracy a, that was a new term for me i had never heard that term before dick deep. yeah we tried to do a quick and dirty etymology search but we couldn't really some to do with the pro uh you know like bootlegging but i don't know but it's it's sort of right like yeah matt like you said it's kind of a way to describe you know for, for for people of color to describe other people of color who to them are sort of coming off as like above or, or uh, you know, I'm putting myself above you or in some cases like you're acting white or whatever. Right. Which is still a, a prominent aspect, I think, now. Right. I think. Yeah. The, uh, yeah. Obviously, the, I think that like, is still happening. Well, he has there's a character named Hanby at the very end of I, I think the, the story is called Canvas. Uh is that the end, uh, the final story? Yeah. Ca- yeah, Cabinus. Uh, but then Hanby is like the annoying, like sort of a, epitome. Like of, middle manager guy. Of Dicty. He, yes. He's just absolutely affecting, like not even a contemporary white, because the actual white people <laughs> that are even depicted in this book are mostly just southern rural people too. They don't talk like how Hanby talks, which right. is the point. He's like, he sounds like a, he's just doing Shakespeare. Yes. Which I think, uh, like, that's where the class element really comes through to me, right? Is And you said this, Matt, like, most of the white people in this book, aside from the the guy the that gets, gets killed, throat, like, yeah, um, uh, are poor and rural and, like, have nothing as well. And then I think you're, you're right to say, like, Hanby is so over the top in his, like, speech and his, like, you know, affectations – well, he's like the, he's a respectability guy. He's right. like, uh, yeah, he's doing the pull your pants up kind of shit. Yes, and I I highlighted the quote that he said when he he sort of like swaggers into and they're just having like they're finally drinking some liquor to just chill out because like Canvas had like a stressful. He thought he was being uh, chased or something. Yeah, he thought he was getting run out of town. Yeah, and then Canvas like somehow immediately learns that they took one sip of alcohol on the premises <laughs> and he like busts he just kicks down the door and he's in their house and he just says this uh hey, professor canvas to come straight to the point the progress of the negro race is jeopardized whenever the personal habits and examples set by its guides and mentors fall below the acknowledged and hard-won standard of its average member <laughs> this institution of which i am the humble president was founded and has been maintained at a cost of great labor and untold sacrifice its purpose is to teach our youth to live better, cleaner, more noble lives, to prove to the world that the Negro race can be just like any other race. <laughs> it hopes to attain this aim partly by the salutary example <laughs> set by its instructors. I cannot hinder the progress of a race simply to indulge a single member. I have thought the matter out beforehand, I can assure you. Therefore, if I find your resignation on my desk tomorrow by morning, Mr. Canvas, I shall not feel obliged to call the sheriff. <laughs> <laughs> he just, he just, but they take one sip of corn liquor. This man kicks down the door, walks in, and just says that. Literally, literally, dude. That's and, it's, <laughs> and it's supposed to be funny, you know. He's like a yeah. ludicrous figure. It, the, he's like a, it's he literally had the Metal Gear Solid guard sound go off over his head as soon as they took <laughs> the illegal sips of liquor, <laughs> and then delivered a Kojima cutscene level of content <laughs> <laughs> that no one exactly, asked for. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. It, it, that that is such a that's such a funny like telling scene. Um, what? I'm just drinking coin liquor. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> I like that they spell liquor the entire book. L i c k e r. Yes. Bring that back. Uh, seriously, yeah, that's a great spelling. That's liquor. a rubber buns and liquor level of. Uh... <laughs> I love that. I love that <laughs> joke. Well, he. I mean, even in his writing, you know, in some of the dialogue, Toomer is very conscious to do like. Uh, to write it kind of the way that it's spoken to him. Like there's a lot of just like the letter Y is thrown in there to, to, to signal you. Yes. And like, it's very, um, I don't know what the term is when something's written exactly the way it sounds, not like onomatopoeia, but you know what I mean? Right. Like, yeah. It's very like exact and literal kind of as it sounds to, to vernacular. I, maybe. Yeah. Um, which I think is sort of consonant with the general approach of modernism, trying to sort of like capture the realities of experience. It's almost like a phenomenological thing, right? Like this is how the words are actually spoken, so I'm going to write them this way. Is yeah, it I'm kind of phonetically. Is it? Ph- yeah, maybe phonetically is what I'm looking for. Yeah, 
But it's important too, right? Because like uh, the, I think the book is doing something of the modernist poet emphasis on, and again, like I believe Canvas even discusses this as an- another one of these people who I, I imagine is like a fragment of Toomer's own personality, mm-hmm. like coming in to speak, where he's like, yeah, maybe I'm like all brain and like I can't uh, do woodworking, but like I've. I've learned these words so that, you know, they confuse with my soul and I can like taste them and like the texture of the words. And that's sort of how he characterizes it. It's because Cabness is a weird character. He's like in the town and sort of like kind of just gets caught up in, you know, the life of the town and winds up working for this guy at like, yeah, like the woodworking shop. Um, After failing to be a teacher? Yeah. After getting fired by uh, Habney. Right, right, Handy, right. Handy. Handy, yeah. Um, uh, and, it, yeah, th- that story was so interesting to me. Because it's like, kind of nothing happens at some level. You know what I yeah. mean? And, and it, But again, it's like these stories are so indeterminate and so kind of... And th- he has this, like, sort of religious experience almost with this at a old party. man. At a party, yeah. With, with you know, with these women and th- with this old man in a basement. And who's just sitting there watching and, like, muttering, like, t- sin to himself over and over again. And ultimately, <laughs> Cabinus like, blows up at him and, like, goes on this diatribe. Mm-hmm. And then just goes back upstairs and goes to work. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, again, there's no... Yeah, like you said, there's emphatically indeterminate. Uh, which maybe, you know, the, the point was... was again just to represent the contemporary and a- by that i mean 1920s sort of um state of things right not not you know, and that's where maybe the like the difference between whatever his ideals may have been and what it is we're reading here in the book uh that's that's where that comes from is he, he might be doing the realism thing in some level of just trying to evoke this this like uh, as much as possible in his like condensed and economical way and poetically of like the present moment yeah which is what perfection which is you know like i said before that's how i read it and um that's how a lot of the people in the back of my book described it too is that it, it seemed to be almost like a snapshot or a tone poem of a certain period in history that doesn't really give you any answers and that adds to the realism of it just being a snapshot. And I was thinking about last week's book, uh, Killing a Minotauri and just Murakami having an an unfulfilled uh, loop um, adding to the realism of any story. And uh, True. I was actually thinking a little bit, maybe Matt, you can talk about this further, but I was thinking the way that Toomer thinks of his own work is kind of how like John Mouse talks about his own music. You know, like he's canceled, oh, giving bro. this. What <laughs> he went to the Trump rally. He's canceled. It's over. No, it's fine. Don't we, worry about it. I'm we can still talk about it. I'm joking. I'm joking. Um, but do you do you kind of understand what I'm saying? Like someone yes. who, you like over explains or has this very particular idea, or, or even like I'm showing my hipster quality, but even like Neutral <laughs> Milk Hotel, uh, Jeff Mangum. Magnus Ma- Mangum. Mangum, the way that he talks about his. Uh, lyrics in particular is just like, what are you talking about? It's not, ex- I don't get that at all from what this song is about. Um, so there's like hidden meetings that the artist is interjecting and how they see their work is very particular. Um, and maybe that adds to some of level of the truth and you can decipher it from the text because you know that that's what their intention was. But just simply reading it or listening to the music from a particular artist, like you, you do get a different experience, at least from the first read through. Uh, yeah, I, I take your meaning L- less with Mangum. I think uh, it's it, it the analogy to Mouse is a little bit better in the sense that uh, he does have an incredibly robust and almost overly complicated political view of what he's doing. Um, that then yeah, I really like, don't know much about it, but which I mean, certainly, I guess that's the only th- that's the analogy I'm willing to accept is that like Tumor also clearly thought a lot 
like this book was constructed over a number of years mm -hmm. and you know just hearing yeah like these these structures and and the hopes and and the the um synthesis of of the various like political ideologies and, and theories he was learning over time yes it's it, you're right it, it's almost too much to hope for when you do a work like this and and if you especially if you set yourself up to potentially to like think that that's all that's all going to be at some point apparent to like the perfect ideal reader of some kind or the perfect recipient of your art yeah it's just, it's just you can't ex quite expect that which i i, I get the prince oh go for it well i was just gonna say it's not i'm not sure that if tumor did expect that like it, again i just feel like there's this disconnect because like reading this again with all the ambiguity all the open-endedness and like what it, it, I can't imagine that he he was like, yes, this is very clear, and I'm getting a very straightforward point across that somebody will get. And that's not the, even like that wasn't even like the modernist notion at all either. Right. If you think of Finnegan's guys, Wake, and it's like, yeah, exactly. You guys talked about like I before the podcast started. I said that this book was you know critically revered when it was first uh, published, and then it you know kind of dwindled. But I think Gabe, you were saying that. Uh, even though it was, you know, accepted in, in critical circles as like a work of art, it was it wasn't like the critics actually understood what he was trying to get across, and that actually discouraged him. And he only wrote one book. Like, yep. I yeah. think that it it might be a factor into his uh, his lack of engagement with any more novels that people didn't generally get it the way he wanted people to. I think that's definitely part of it. I also think from what I understand from reading like the intro and stuff like, and you know, a couple other things around Toomer's life is that, you know, one of the other big things that pissed him off is that like, even like his editor insisted on marketing the book as like African American literature and, you know, right. like black literature, literature of the South, like whatever. And he was really, really pissed about that. And, you know, he, he, I think Toomer thought that like, and I think, and this is obviously kind of like, you know, we can, t we can talk about this being sort of like a problematic view or whatever in today's context, but, you know, Toomer, I think, was like, well, why is it, why is it, you know, why has it got to be black? Like, let it just, like, he, he just wanted it to be viewed as, like, just art or whatever, right? And he yes. sort of balked at the idea, or not, not, even, not even balked, was deeply upset when it was marketed and reviewed under the sort of umbrella of like black literature so i think he even rejected some of the critical praise because it was like you know oh yeah, yeah. it's good for black literature or it's good like for southern literature or whatever and he was like well just fucking read it as it is which you know i i reject that view from my vantage point in 2021 today but uh you know obviously i think tumor had a different experience and a different view of it. Yeah. And like the acceptance of it, it, it's all mixed up because, you know, plenty of other, you know, white authors were also seeking to create some kind of art, capital A art that was uh, no longer beholden to polit politics or post political. Social yeah. Uh, it just sort of isolation, sort of platonic beauty or whatever. But, um, it, that's also mixed co more complicatedly in tumor with like the the desire to also be looked at as just like a human for human sake right and not uh, a race and and then just taking on the baggage of you uh you froze for a second there matt hold on a second elon musk get the fuck out of our god get your stream get your ai ghost in a shell uh net form out of my computer <laughs> Nobody likes right. viruses. We don't want no your one viruses. Like, yeah. You're not the movie Serenity? <laughs> I don't know. I don't even know what that one is. What's the one where Johnny Depp is like... Uh, in, Pirates in of the every, Caribbean. <laughs> in everyone's computer. Do you know what I'm talking about? Uh, Alice in Wonderland. Nathan, the Nathan for You episode. Where, Shut up, you guys. Don't Stop. Don't give me troll answers. <laughs> Engage with me seriously about Johnny Depp being in your computer. <laughs> oh, I know what you're talking about. There's a Nathan uh, for You episode where there's a Johnny Depp impersonator who plays a hacker. It's really funny. John John Depp. Transcendence. That's the name of the movie. So anyway. I never saw uh, it. Yeah, right. <laughs> I never saw it. <laughs> Paul, okay. Paul's like, yeah, South Park. I don't like it or haven't seen it. <laughs> like, here's a reference that I know about. Yeah. <laughs> What were but you I, saying, I, Matt? Uh, where did I get cut off once again? 
I because I I'm my my mind palace is so delicate. You have too much coffee. Yeah, get, I got get that, that coffee. I got that coffee <laughs> too much of it. Uh, I kind of forget what I was saying. We were talking I about went to the bathroom. So I, I was I had it. sort of just made the point that like you know. Oh right, uh, yeah. just that like. The, the, I, I just think there's a uh, an added layer of when you talk about the yeah somewhat at this vantage point more complicated and and, and somewhat naive hope to create art di- distinct from its contexts right uh, that that was also in Tumor's case attached to his desire to just be regarded as as an individual and not and not uh, you know someone else's conception of a race or anything like that well, and know? I do think it it speaks to the the kind of like the post-racial instinct or the post-racial moment particularly in that era where like slavery's over we're you know trying to do reconstruction and whatever and like I think the ideal like probably felt a lot closer to some people, to people of a certain, like, you know, who had grown up like with slavery and now there's no more slavery. I don't know. I could see that view being tempting. Yeah. The times were different than prior. Uh, and, and that invited some, what probably, I mean, obviously in light of history currently, but like naive and incorrect. Matt, you're, ch- you're chopping, bro. You're chopping again. You know what? Just call me this fucking thing. We're back. Yeah, we're I'm, back. I'm, I'm. We, uh, this makes me uncomfortable, and I'm oddly sickly happy that someone else is having audio issues because it. <laughs> I want someone else to experience how shitty that is. This is Get the first. Your, I'm maybe this a slither. Is the first for Matt. Yeah, yeah, this is the first for me. Maybe what is this button? I'm gonna press this button. Sorry if something bad happens. <laughs> okay. The computer just explodes. Did it? Do I? <laughs> am is it the same? You sound Sounds fine. Now. Okay. All right. All right, sorry guys. This is a cursed episode for me. It's it's, right. it's it's. I mean, we know what happened. You slandered Elon Musk. Yep. And now he's in my computer. And now he's in your computer. Yeah. So, <laughs> anyway, what were we talking uh, about? I don't Let's, remember. That. I forget. Someone else. Well, just... I wanted to go back. One of the, I mean, I'm you know, I wanted to go back a little bit to box seat, which you mentioned Matt earlier, enjoying. Yeah. Um. Because I wondered, it, like, that one for me, you know, we talked about in Cabinets at the end when he has this kind of, like, you know, religious experience and blows up at the old man. Like, there's a few of those throughout this book where there, there are these kind of, like, moments of, like, pent-up frustration or anger or whatever that kind of explode in these, like, you know, pseudo-religious kind of ways almost. Um, yeah, there's, I mean, Christianity looms large despite post whatever yes absolutely and i mean i think even the name i think even the title of the book is supposed to be a biblical cain and abel thing as well oh that's interesting i hadn't made that connection and like raising cain and and that being also consonant with the crop and sorghum and that you know yes sap and blood and roots and all that interesting because paul you sent us the raising cain's chicken fingers picture this morning <laughs> <laughs> right. Honestly, shout outs to and Raisin all Cane's. I got. If you guys want to sponsor this episode, your chicken fingers are delicious. Yeah. I almost got them. beat up at a Raisin Cane's once. How? I was in Minneapolis and I was, uh, it was a tough time in my life and I was delivering food for Postmates. <laughs> and um, it was like. Uh, Not like now when you're a professional podcaster making videos. Oh, now I'm like totally yeah. fine. Yeah, it's great now. Um, but I walked in and I was. I had these like weird fake glasses on that kind of looked like um, Benjamin Franklin type glasses. It was, and I was trying out a new look. Bifocals. And there was just a bunch of teenagers in there. And I was like, I don't want to be in this place right now with these glasses on. And this kid who was just like full of testosterone, just like skater kid, just looked at me and was like, hey, man, nice glasses. Ooh, and like all of his dude. friends like perked up. Skater boy. And I was like, yeah, thank you. And then I just got my food and left. And um, they wanted to beat me up. They were like, they were tensed up. So you got bullied and and you didn't do anything. (laughs) No, what What was I going to do? Just fight like eight teenagers that were holding skateboards? Yeah, you're going to get decked in the literal sense. They had wood and wheels and metal that they could have hit me with. Yeah, no, you made the right call, Paul. You were the bigger person. I'm I'm joking. I'm joking. Obviously, yeah. This podcast encourages bullying. Getting, getting into, into a fights fight is with just te- bad. 
with eight teenagers and they're just bludgeoning you with skateboards <laughs> in the middle of a raising canes chicken <laughs> is a just funny eating image. their chicken. Yeah. Bad. Don't do that though. Um, so anyway, I wanted to read this passage from Box Seat because I mean, there's a couple that I wanted to read. This was one of my favorite stories as well, Matt. Um, but I, the one I wanted to read specifically, this story, I don't know if anyone ever else felt this way. You mentioned, I think, earlier, like, Paul mentioned some of the, like, stream of consciousness and some of the, like, hallucinatory, like, fever, feverish aspects of some of this writing. This story specifically gave me, like, Uncut Gems vibes. Like, it was so, like, tense and, like, you know, just, like, every moment made me sweat, like, specifically yeah. towards the back half. Um, so this is, like, him... Uh, Arriving at the theater, Dan is ushered down the aisle. He has to squeeze past the knees of seated people to reach his own seat. He treads on a man's corns. The man grumbles and shoves him off. He shrivels close behind a portly negress whose huge rolls of flesh meet about the bones of seat arms. A soil-soaked fragrance comes from her. Through the cement floor, her strong roots sink down. They spread under the asphalt streets. Dreaming, the streets roll over on their bellies and suck their glossy health from them. Her strong roots sink down and spread under the river and disappear in bloodlines that waver south. Her roots shoot down. Dan's hands follow them. Her roots throb. Dan's heart beats violently. He places his palms upon the earth to cool them. Earth throbs. Dan hearts, Dan's heart beats violently. He sees all the people in the house rush to the walls to listen to the rumble. A new world Christ is coming up. Dan comes up. He is startled. The eyes of the woman don't belong to her. They look at him pleasantly. From either aisle, bolted masses press in. He doesn't fit. The mask grows adjutant for an instant. Dan's and Muriel's eyes meet. His weight there slides the weight on her. She braces an arm against the brass rail and turns her head away. Yeah. I, I was like, I'm sweating. This whole thing, like, it's just making me... And again, like, the, like, you know, there's a lot of imagery about, like, things flowing and or being, like, sucked in. There's, like, a passage in one of the earlier texts about one of the, the, the women... It might be from Fern also, Paul, where they describe, like, the whole sky being, like, sucked into her face, basically. <laughs> yeah. uh, so there's a lot of imagery about things being sucked and flowing and, and sort of this, like, gravitational, not like, okay, wow. And I, know, I, laughed, and then I, I laughed and then I shook my head because I'm such an idiot. But, like, a sort of, like, gravitational imagery. Right. And, again, they have the roots and cane and the blood right. of... of freaking sap and all that kind of stuff yes and it sounds like it's also there's like the whole notion in that story of like a new messiah arriving from underground that sounds yes. like satan it that sounds, sounds like, like a demon it, is coming it, it, yeah it does <laughs> i mean i also I, I think the this point was made in the because there's a couple times where something like that is mentioned like a something arising from underground and right. hutchinson in the introduction raising canes raising canes. yeah dude, God that's, damn it, dude. not even that's what i literally meant but so Hutchinson makes the argument that that could also be read as a, as if we're taking the sort of Marxist tack or the leftist tack as a way of talking about like a proletarian uprising, right? Like a right, working class below. or a lower class uprising from below. Yeah. Yeah, sense. I think it's something that you have to connect the dots to after you, like I said before, after you know more about his political intentions, because, you know, just reading that without that knowledge for me, it was just like this. I was thinking this is where his strengths and artistic achievements lie within this novel is like these weird beautiful passages um mixed with like a little bit of poetry here and there not just the poetic passages like the actual poems but like within his actual own writing i would say that it like borders on prose and poetry yeah and i think that that was his biggest strength for me but i'm not saying that like obviously there's another element that you can get like Gabe, what you, what you were saying, mm. if you have more knowledge of the text, well, I'm not those, sure like, if you can get it just from just from reading. But I don't know. Well, there's the there's the like I think the key there is Dan's outburst, right? Like, what does he say? Jesus. At was the once, end, he says Jesus was once a leper. Was once a leper. Just shouts think, out in the theater. I think that's yeah. a pretty clear. He's a joker. A relatively clear statement. Yeah. It's not cra shouting fire in a crowded theater. It's a little cooler. Uh, <laughs> yeah. I'm going to try that out next time. I should have said that during Mortal Kombat. Oh, my God. Jesus was a leper. Jesus was once a leper. I mean, there's also, even in that story, you know, speaking of kind of the biblical imagery, there's, there's to me, what is kind of a 
pretty clear reference to Samson in, in what Dan is thinking. He, he says oh, at yeah. one point, he says, and again, so it goes, Dan, colon, I'm going to reach up and grab the girders of this building and pull them down. The crash will be a signal. Hid by the smoke and dust, Dan Moore will arise. In his right hand will be a dynamo. In his left, a god's face that will flash white light from ebony. I'll grab a girder and swing it like a walking stick. Lightning will flash. I'll grab its black knob and swing it like a crippled cane. Lightning, someone's flashing, someone's flashing. Who in the hell is flashing that mirror? Take it off me, god damn you. <laughs> Dan, is going, Dan is going through it, though. Dan's, Dan say. is going through it, no question. <laughs> Dan is having a hard time. He's 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 having a, just having a normal one. <laughs> Sir, this is a raisin canes. <laughs> <laughs> I'm so sorry. No, that was great. That was great. But, but I love the way. I mean, I love the way that story ends too, because he ultimately, like, again, start like is about to get into a fight, kind of like Paul at the raisin canes, yeah. and like they go outside, and he just. The way the story ends, I think he is forgets. so good. He just forgets, yeah. <laughs> this is how the, that story ends. The man leads Dan up a black alley. The alley air is thick and moist with smells of garbage and wet trash. In the morning, singing N-words will drive by and ring their gongs. Heavy with the scent of rancid flowers and with the scent of fight, the crowd pressing forward is a hollow roar. Eyes of houses, soft girl eyes glow reticently upon the hubbub and blink out. The man stops, takes off his hat and coat. Dan... Having forgotten him, keeps going on. Yeah, <laughs> I thought that he, was so good. He's delirious. He's he's uh, he's out of it. He's on some he's on some other shit. He's trying not to work. He's trying to he's trying to transcend. He's like post work. I liked that <laughs> aspect of it. Yes, <laughs> true. You know, I'm trying to do something else. I'm on I'm on some other shit, dude. I uh, what was the? I had a poem by E. E. Cummings that I had tabbed out, and I've. I just remembered why. Uh, I'm nervous to read it while Gabe's gone. Uh, okay. Why? Because because he's the one that can stop the recording if my mic go- gets fucked up again. <laughs> that is true. <laughs> so maybe we could talk about something else until he's here of less consequence. But you just introduced it, and now we're on that topic. All right. Fair enough. Fair enough. Let me go find the story, because I can't remember. It's the one uh, where... I think it's just called theater. Um, mm-hmm. Yeah, theater. Well, if you want, if you want, I can underline some random thing, or I can read some random thing that I underline. Yeah, sure. In the meantime, let me Do find it, up. it. It's a safer bet. Yeah. Like I said, got folks. I'm sorry, but Elon Musk is in my side, my computer. No, I'm just gonna see why I underline this. Let me just read it, and maybe it'll come to mind why. Okay. Uh, nothing. I this is an AV on okay. my page forty-five. Probably different for you. Nothing I didn't. Nothing I did seemed able to change AV's indifference to me. I played basketball, and when I'd make a long, clean shot, she'd clap with the others louder than they. I thought uh, I'd meet her on the street, and there'd be no difference in the way she said hello. She never took the trouble to call me by my name. On days for drill, I'd let my voice down a tone and call for a complicated maneuver when I saw her coming. She'd smile appreciation, but it was an impersonal smile, never for me. I think I underlined this just because I thought uh, he just had a good way of describing like the lust after a girl that doesn't care about you. And this right. chapter was kind of filled with that. And I thought that was uh, just a good ability he had. It was just like trying to get someone's attention and they just don't care. There's a lot of people seeking some sort of recognition and i think we mentioned at the top right like women's recognition in particular is is a big part of that it seems to me in this book right and like that you can orient your identity around people's recognition and there's a lot of stories about like yes doing shit for women right like acting out like trying to do something cool you know i think he's he's critical of that desire that men have, but also it doesn't really give you an answer of what to do about it. Right. Cause it's like also very much part of what I would imagine tumor would regard as like something natural. So the real, right? Like, the, you know, this is, is what it is like, uh, no, no interest in, in destroying it or trying to transcend it, but it's still like 
mixed about it. Like still still register the pain of it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, okay, so the, actually, that's good. That works into what I was going to say, Gabe. I just wanted you here so you could cut, cut my mic if it starts to fuck up again while okay. I'm reading. <laughs> uh, which is the story... Um, the th- it was a story called Theater, where uh, basically you just have, like... Uh, this one was fairly... This one su- was uh, a little bit more, like, over in its concepts here. It's literally... It's very sh- it's a very little tiny one short story mm-hmm. uh, about this, like, guy who's like the theater director's son and he's just a kind of a brain he's intellect and he's watching this uh black woman in this like theater troupe uh dancing and she is like instinct and whatever like feminine you know like fucking feminine intuition and wiles and this kind of stuff and she's she's dancing for him and she's like you know they both like are interested in each other but they can't they just can't cross this boundary they have because they both are thinking in in too pure of one of these two terms, right? right. Bodily or intellectually. Uh, and I was just I was thinking. It made me think of a whole other thing. It made me think of uh, this poem by E. E. Cummings. Um, which uh, let's see if we can find it. Uh, which is called "Sense Feeling Is First, which I really love. Uh, and I just wanted to read this because I think that poem, this poem, is this story kind of even shorter basically which go so it goes like this uh since feeling is first who pays any attention to the syntax of things will never wholly kiss you holy to be a fool while spring is in the world my blood approves and kisses are a better uh, are a better fate than wisdom lady i swear by all flowers don't cry the best gesture of my brain is less than your eyelids flutter which says we are for each other then laugh, leaning back in my arms, for life's not a paragraph, and death, I think, is no parentheses. I like that poem. I think, yeah, that's fantastic. And I, mean, and I think you're right in relating it to that story, too. That's just like, you're not, you know, you're, it's just a sort of, it's partially like a just cautionary about over-intellectualizing, and I think that's right. uh, something that Toomer was very aware of himself potentially having done and it, it under threat of doing at any moment during these these things which are both politically complicated and 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 involve world systems and you know the, the ideal ways to uh, order society but then also actual human beings mm. and like i mean this is always the complexity of of you know political issues especially um but you know just trying not to lose sight of either and and what will happen if you do yes um i wanted to read speaking of reading poems there's one that i that jumped out to me that i kind of wanted to read from oh yeah this. there are poems in this book yeah yeah uh from this one it's um uh, from me and matt it's on page 93 91 to 92 it's called harvest song and there's a, i just think this is a good like a number you know in a number of ways kind of touches on some of tumor's like concerns and themes as well. So it's called Harvest Song. Um, I am a reaper whose muscles set at sundown. All my oats are cradled, but I am too chilled and too fatigued to bind them, and I hunger. I crack a grain between my teeth. I do not taste it. I've been in the fields all day. My throat is dry. I hunger. My eyes are caked with dust of oat fields at harvest time. I am a blind man who stares across the hills, seeing stacked fields of other harvesters. It would be good to see them, crooked, split, and iron-ringed, handles of the scythes. It would be good to see them, dust-caked and blind. I hunger. Dusk is strange, feared sheath. Their blades are dulled in. My throat is dry, and and should I call a cracked grain like the oats? Eoho. I fear to call. What should they hear me and offer me, their grain, oats, or wheat, or corn? I have been in the fields all day. I fear I could not taste it. I fear knowledge of my hunger. My ears are caked with dust of oat fields at harvest time. I am a deaf man who strains to hear the calls of other harvesters whose throats are also dry. It would be good to hear their songs, reapers of the sweet stalked cane, cutters of the corn, even though their throats cracked and the strangeness of their voices deafened me. I hunger, my throat is dry. Now that the sun has set and I am chilled, I fear to call. Yo-ho, my brothers. I am a reaper, yo-ho. My oats are cradled, but I am too fatigued to bind them. And I hunger, I crack a grain. It has no taste to it, my throat is dry. 
Oh, my brothers, I beat my palms still soft against the stubble of my harvesting. You beat your soft palms too. My pain is sweet, sweeter than the oats or wheat or corn. It will not bring me knowledge of my hunger. I thought it was, I thought that poem like touches on so many things that Toomer is concerned with. Like, I think it touches on his sort of feeling of isolation and like lack of community, right? And kind of like his feeling of being distanced from his own like identity and, and trauma in a way that he's like trying to reckon with, right? He wants to sort of reject it, but can't and like still feels it. And I don't know. I thought it, that poem got to me a little bit. Yeah, yeah. I think it, it does point to what I see as his desire to have some sort of, of a reversion to a past or a culture that should be... Um, like, he, he believes... I, I feels like he believes black culture should have its own resurgence or acceptance. Um, no, I'm not saying, of course, that he thinks people should be back working in the fields, like cutting corn, obviously. It's like he 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 wants to. I don't know. He wants to love. He wants people to love that aspect of African Americans or something. I don't know. Um, yeah, my my potentially wrong interpretation is just yeah. Like, there's the isolation. He he. It takes comfort or you know in some form like seeing others in this plight. But you know recognition of things is not you know it's like diagnosis is not the cure like you, your hunger will not be satiated and like your pain will not ultimately necessarily have any meaning but like somehow that's also not it doesn't make it useless to regard and to meditate on and that kind of thing right yeah i think yeah that that makes a lot of sense to me and then they're also thirsty and life is water being drawn off yes uh and so there is just, yeah, I, I, I'm trying to avoid saying something as like fucking lame as like death and life are indis indistinguishable. The only thing, <laughs> sex shut and up, death. Shut dude. up, shut up, <laughs> shut up, shut up, shut <laughs> up. Don't say it. Okay. I wanted, I wanted to flag something that I saw in the foreword that is just, just made me laugh. Uh, which is just uh, at some point in Tumor's intellectual development, especially like during his socialism heavy phase uh he went to the uh the rand school of the social sciences mm -hmm. and i have not much to, to mention to that but i i do think it's funny because this is around like rand is such a fucking ubiquitous think tank fucking name name and nefarious entity still and uh it got its start roughly around the first world war and so it just makes sense to me that that's true and especially the social sciences because i think uh the forward before the introduction mentions a lot about obama and i think there are legitimate uh, zinzi clemens right yes and i think there are i think that's just interesting like pro proffering those kind of like social science notions i think there's a direct line between at least rand's intention for it uh and needing people like uh tumor to be like the avatars of it in early mm. stages and th that's where i see the lines to like obama and the cynical deployment of it in like the 21st century that's actually really interesting yeah i had not made that connection i wonder if there's like a, a line like a direct line between that school and the organization as it exists today i'd be curious i think so because it just stands for research and development it was just some like everything it was just like a sort of military Right. Research center that turned into a think tank. But yeah, just just thought it was interesting that it's it, that little fucking name crops up throughout history. And it's really it's it's kind of growing. It, it's it's metastasizing around this time. into yes. something bigger. Uh, but that, you know, ultimately, you know, I, 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 it, I don't think tumor falls into falls prey to whatever some sort of nefarious yeah, think tank yeah. plot. No, I mean, I think, you know, yeah, I think, t I think, yeah, we can draw lines from some of the ideology that Toomer is talking about here. And I think, you know, I think the fact that he kind of like went down the road of like kind of vague, vaguely Eastern spirituality later on in his life kind of checks out to me in terms mm -hmm. of sort of his kind of uh, 
general artistic approach and like the it reminds me of like Esperanto or something too, right? Yes. Like the the no, the what when was that sort of thing? Was that then or that was earlier? Like in I don't 19th know century? when Esperanto was first like proposed as a thing. Because there was the, Esperanto was one, but there were there was also like this idea of like reuniting the Tower of Babel, yes. kind of you know unifying one language, one world, one love. <laughs> so it, it was actually eighteen eighty seven was the first uh, kind of development of it apparently. Santayana? Who? Who? No, 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 no. Uh, Spinoza? Some, somebody like that? Who did the Monad shit? Uh, the Monads was Leibniz. Leibniz. Anyway, I don't know. I'm, I'm riffing at this point. I, you, you actually studied philosophy. I just. Well, but no. I mean... One language, one love. Definitely one language, like one love. A, some weird 19th century thing. Yeah, and I think that you know. Right, that that again, it tracks with Toomer's sort of feeling that like we need to transcend all these categories, and people still talk like this today, except they're all just fucking, totally. They're all just fucking QAnon people now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it it runs the gamut of ideology, which is how you know it's like now it's just like some weird. Yeah, most people are like we got to transcend it. It's like, but then it's like just weird, like all lives matter people yes. or it's like <laughs> QAnon conservatives. It's always so strange. Yeah. So it's interesting to think about how, you know, sort of how that ideology played out in tumors time, like uh, post racialism or like we're all Americans, not fucking white or black or whatever versus how it is deployed now in those various ways. It's just like literally a generation earlier. You, there's just slave people, like people that were just like slaves. Yeah, that's what's so crazy about that. Just like once, like your dad. Yes, you know what I mean. Like th- th- that's such a huge. That's just, I don't know. Th- th- I I I can't fathom, the feel of something like that. Right. And and again, like I, like we've said, like I just think, I think Tumor was, I don't know. He felt it felt very, pessimistic to me, which is again not kind of the vibe that you, we get reading some of the supplementary materials and shit. Like, there's there, there's a line here that, um, this is from Fern, which is that one we mentioned earlier, mm-hmm. that I feel like f- stuck out to me in this connection. He, so this is, this is a guy who ha- is kind of like, this one felt very autobiographical to me. Like, this felt like it definitely happened to Tumor. <laughs> yeah. Like, when he was in the South and he got, like, kind of, like, a little bit of a Lolita, Lolita obsession with this young girl, and she was like mysterious and whatever, whatever. And I, and this is also an interesting story because he addresses the reader directly a number of times. And it's like, what would you do here? Like, would, right. you, would you take her hand? Would you look her in the eyes? Like, whatever, whatever. Um, and he asks the reader for advice, like, what should I give to her? It's it's really kind of sticks out in a number of formal ways. That's as true. Yeah. As the story, but anyway, he says. Let's take a walk, I at last ventured. The suggestion coming after so long in isolation was novel enough, I guess, to surprise. But it wasn't that. Something told me that men before me had said just that as a prelude to the offering of their bodies. I tried to tell her with my eyes. I think she understood. The thing from her that made my throat catch vanished. Its passing left her visible in a way I'd thought but never seen. We walked down the pike with people on all the porches gaping at us. Doesn't it make you sad? She meant the row of petty gossiping people. She meant the world. <laughs> and it was just like, fuck. Yeah. Yeah. Right. That's kind of Tumor's vibe. Doesn't and it I make think, you sad? I think, I, I think it's mentioned somewhere that Tumor had, had offered or had posited to publishers like a, a, a follow-up sort of uh, yeah, think so. work that... Um, would have maybe tried to show the, uh, the the possible future of after the world of this book, mm. and again significantly was abandoned, uh, and words in general were look at, looked at as which is a, a, a you know that is another prelude to postmodernism, <laughs> right? <laughs> like that attitude, like exhausting, feeling exhausted, and and the failure of language, almost like you're putting, you're building a wall of words and, and between yourself and what you're trying to do, and and that whole thing. Yeah. What happened to that text? Is that even out there anywhere? Is it? He, just he like, never wrote it. He just never did it. Oh, he didn't even write it. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. yeah. So yeah, I was. Uh, 
this uh, this was a very, again, just experientially, a very uh, tense, upsetting book, kind of, yes. more than anything else. Like, yes. really. Uh, th- th- not, a, not a feel-good thing whatsoever. No, definitely not feel-good. <laughs> um, yeah. Any uh, final thoughts, maybe, before, or any other passages you wanted to read? I'll give a glance, but I think I think most of what I had wanted to say, I said. I guess I'll, th- I, I can kind of just, there's one more passage, passage that I had highlighted about, from the very beginning, from the first chapter, because I just feel like it, captures that kind of class element and that sort of sense of you know the those larger forces at play so this is like a story it's called Carintha and it's about this again kind of one of these overly sexualized young girls who like men sort of right, pursue. At, the, right at the top right uh what's that one of the first things, this is right? the the first story the yeah. first story um so uh this is it's it, this is basically sort of the end of the end of the story um Young man, uh, Carintha is a woman. Young men run stills to make her money. Young men go to the big cities and run the road. Young men go away to college. They all want to bring her money. These are the young men who thought that all they had to do was to count time. But Carintha is a woman and she has had a child. A child fell out of her womb onto a bed of pine needles in the forest. Pine needles are smooth and sweet. They are elastic to the feet of rabbits. A sawmill was nearby. Its pyramidal sawdust pile smoldered. It is a year before one completely burns. Meanwhile, the smoke curls up and hangs in odd rates about the trees, curls up and spreads itself out over the valley. Weeks after Carintha returned home, the smoke was so heavy you tasted it in the water. Someone made a song. Smoke is on the hills, rise up. Smoke is on the hills, O rise, and take my soul to Jesus. I got a poem, too. Hit it. This is Portrait in Georgia. Uh which creeped me out because uh hair braided chestnut coiled like a lyncher's rope eyes faggots lips old scars or the first red blisters breath the last sweet scent of cane and her slim body white as the ash of black flesh after flame Oof! oh my god (laughs) yeah that's goosebumps not feel good either no (laughs) so yeah pretty feel bad and you know the poem. The, I, I like this interspersion of of poetry, which Tumor wrote to mix with the prose. Again, something I don't see as often. Um, and if one of the ideas of poetry is is that they are these condensed forms of meaning, these uh, these almost like hype, yeah, like sort of hyper dense packets of of meaning and information to to kind of burst into your head and create seeds for like what is then. I guess drawn out in a slightly more belabored fashion mm-hmm. uh, in the narrative of the prose. Like, I don't know. That, that just was like a very effective technique that I again have not seen um, all too often. If I do, it's it's specifically not. It's like a epigraph or whatever. It's or like a little header quote. It's not the poetry of the author right. himself. You know. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, I liked it too. It was like usually when you see that, it is just at the beginning of a chapter or something like that. It's mm-hmm. not like interjected sporadically because not all the stories ended up having poems afterwards I don't think nope. um, yeah I thought it was really unique and effective technique he was using and even there in that one you just read Matt there's it's it's so much of the body the, yeah the, there's this obs- not, you know not obsession but this recurring theme with the body and the various sort of metaphors of the body and, and yeah which again carries out today you know like it's almost it get, it's something that's almost parodied now, like you know bodies bodies in space, like right. you know black bodies in the uh, you know whatever, and it's like, but I mean, it also is powerful, like it's a super powerful and important idea, like yes, physicality and like your live fucking corporeal reality is fucking so fucking important. Yes, like, right. Yeah. So are that's the last thing I wanted to. Are you calling me fat, dude? Corpulent, yeah. <laughs> Corpulent reality. Uh, um, Paul, any final thoughts before we move to the... Yeah, no, I'll get my final... Fucking... I don't know if we can. I'll I don't know if I want to do thoughts, that. Uh, when, I, when I do the scores. Okay, so well, yeah, because I don't know if we can do a Harry Potter segment on this one. There is a feels-bad man no. to some of the Harry... Po- sometimes when Harry Potter is just... Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> 
Yeah. <laughs> ba, 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 we could do uh, the yeah. Jaws theme. We could do a Jaws. Uh, what would that? What would that be? What, what, is that 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 what does that say? Uh, we could say, I didn't think this one through. <laughs> <laughs> it was mostly just the music. You thought of another song you knew, and that's it. Uh, you? Uh, <laughs> John Williams song. That's all I thought of. Is the Harry Potter theme John Williams? Yeah. Yeah, oh, dude. Cool. Okay, I didn't know that. Well, my man shout- banger after banger. Shout out to John Williams. Yeah. Come on the podcast. There are any John Williams podcasts? Come on in. Friend of the show. Um, all right. Well, then let's. Uh, I guess we'll uh, jump to scores then, right? Final yep. thoughts, scores. Uh, as is tradition, I'll, I go last because I picked it. Um, okay, I'll go. go first. Yeah. Um, yeah. This 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 little book. It surprised me. I guess it's having a, a resurgence with amongst you know academics of like Gabe was saying, the Harlem Renaissance and, and just sort of like it finding its way back. I guess it has these sporadic bursts into relevance, um, it, into like studies of black literature and its history in America and stuff. Uh, yeah, this book was very strange. It was upsetting. Uh, and uh, n- not to place too high a premium on novelty, but I, I, I have not read something like this. Again, that's always kind of important for me and and not a flex but i've read quite a lot of stuff and so dude how much how many books have you fucking read dude oh god well (laughs) i just pull immediately pull up a pre like a spreadsheet (laughs) (laughs) a binder actually it'd be in a binder yes you have to read the most number of books and they have to have the most numbers of pages and then you've done the most good reading Mm -hmm. more more books smarter big books better big book brain big (laughs) galaxy brain me uh no i just i i found this book pretty powerful also most importantly i would say and and just interesting to hear about this person uh jean tumor is uh yeah i don't know I, i i thought it was very good um and it gave, but it gave me, the, it did give me this like sort of hollow feeling at the very end, or I don't know, I, I, I don't know how I feel about the score, but I'm gonna give it a three point eight seven. Pretty high, nice. pretty high for a math score. It's good. It's a good book. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I I enjoyed the book. I think a lot of it went over my head, um, but I, I mostly just enjoy. I did enjoy the structure of it. I enjoy the poetry. His writing was just really effective. I really like how he just put together these stories a lot. Um, I uh, I don't have much more to say about it. Maybe I'm tired today. I'm not sure, but I I think I'll give it a three point four. Like I'm not totally into the into just doom and gloom and structure as being solely a way to enjoy something. Like, I don't give that much props to that sort of thing, I think, as I've read more books this year. So, you know, parts of, like, the story elements, I guess, just lacking for me as the simpleton that I am. So, (laughs) 3.4. Nice. You like it? You like it? No no sci-fi elements. Zero. Yeah, definitely. Well, no, not really. Nah, none. No. Um, Yeah, I mean, I'm, I think... I, I definitely agree with Matt. I've, I don't. I can't think of a book that I've read that's kind of, that's really like this. This is a sort of a very unique text in structure and in voice and all of the like kind of weird um, sprinkled in touches, like the the way he does dialogue with the names and the internal. Yeah. Like, I've never seen that before. Um, and you know, interspersing the poetry as well. Yeah, I I, I think this is something that I definitely. You know, in the in the forward, the Zinzi Clemens forward, she talks about like this book having you know this weird cult status when she was in school because it's it, it's not really you can't really teach a book like this in like an undergraduate literature class, <laughs> and so it kind of gets overlooked in some ways, and I feel like that's kind of sad because I do think it should be read alongside you know your Baldwin's and your Hughes's and all that. And, yeah. uh, so, so if, if, if you're into any of that sort of literature, uh, and you haven't read this, do it, you, you really should. Um, 
I'm very close to you, Matt. I was I was at like a three point eight four. So yeah, right on. Like yeah, it's like pretty much bang on, as they say. Cool. Good book. Read it. Kane by Jean Toomer. Yes. Jean Toomer, formerly known, artist formerly known as Eugene Toomer, <laughs> For, the, formerly who, known as Nathan Toomer. Exactly. Oh, <laughs> yes. Oh, also. Uh, <laughs> FKA Nathan Eugene Toomer. <laughs> <laughs> uh, also, if you like this show, then um, we have a Patreon. Gene Toomer also had a with Georgia O'Keefe. That's funny to me. Oh, that is true. We should have brought that in. Yeah, he... Yeah. He had an affair with George O'Keefe, which is dank. Sick, dude. Anyway. Flowers. Or just things that look like vagines. Good job on your sexual escapade tumor. Good job. Yeah. <laughs> most importantly. Most importantly. <laughs> most importantly, nice. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, patreon.com slash spinecrackers youtube.com slash spinecrackers that link doesn't actually work I tried it I don't know how you actually get to our YouTube channel but if you look it up on YouTube spinecrackers you'll find us <laughs> um, we have a broken YouTube link no it's it's not like I don't know if that's how the I don't know I don't know if that's how YouTube links work it's like YouTube slash channel slash a bunch of numbers oh sure yeah yeah, yeah. just find spinecrackers on YouTube oh you don't know YouTube now yet come on yeah, no. Just find it. Get with it, dummies. Yeah. Uh, Instagram. Just type stuff in. Comes we, up. We are on Facebook. <laughs> we do post on Facebook, so we probably shouldn't. I know that's cringe. We should probably have like a Snapchat or a TikTok. Well, if we have any sort of wine moms or whatever, <laughs> like to listen. <laughs> shout out! To, shout out to the wine mom listeners. Yeah, we got it. We got a boomer audience. You know, listen. We'll, we're here for you. We're on Facebook, dude. Dude, listen. Uh, there's a percentage of our audience that is over sixty. I don't know who they are. But it's like five percent. Awesome. How do you know that? On because uh, because uh, Anchor dot com, which is where we host our podcast, has a bunch of uh, fucking stats and shit. Nine percent. Nine percent of our audience is sixty plus. Wow. Right. So shout outs to you all. Honestly, you're the real fucking legends. Yeah. You're probably the only people still listening right now. Yeah, you're the only ones who have learned, have retained any ability to have patience. Patience, staying power, like We're all on thoughtful. our cell phones. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> you're definitely not addicted to Candy Crush pay premium, <laughs> premium <laughs> content. Well, they could be listening if they're still alive. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, did you ever think about how they could be dead, Gabe? Because it's no, past I 60. You never know. <laughs> They just Once. all of our sixty plus listeners are just dead and have our podcast on autoplay and they're all just dead in their beds, <laughs> waiting for someone to find them. Oh man, that's funny and sad. <laughs> no, seriously though, if you're sixty plus, shout outs. Shout outs. You know um, what? This episode's dedicated to you. <laughs> this one goes out to you. <laughs> uh, Show all my fans in the back. <laughs> in the back end of your life. Yeah, the back end. <laughs> one foot in the grave. They all just unsubscribed after yeah. the last two minutes. <laughs> I didn't know these gentlemen were so disrespectful. Uh, all right, everybody. Good night and good luck. Good night and good luck. Good love. Good luck. <laughs> we lo good luck to you. Good night. For the bye, bye. <laughs> love. We love y'all. Yes. Yeah. Bye. Bye.